Good morning and welcome to RUC Virtual Worship. Wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today I'm wearing a special t-shirt. This is free mom hugs. <laughs> I got this a year ago to attend the Orange County Pride. Two friends and I had gone to do our part to counter one type of oppression. We'd planned to do that again, but COVID had other plans. How strange that we should be talking about another type of oppression today in the church that embraces everyone. So virtual mom hugs to each of you. May we gather with praise on our lips, justice deep in our hearts, joy in our souls, and warmth in our actions to all we encounter. Please join in as we sing Every Time I Feel the Spirit. Join me in prayer. Loving and welcoming God, the world around us is in flux. It's hard not to feel unsettled as voices scream for justice and so many are hurting. Many of us are confused as the change came while we were already struggling with isolation and the fear of a very real pandemic. We ask for wisdom to see where you'd have our help, courage to stand up when we're needed, healing from loss and illness, and willingness to look outside our own eyes and our own experiences to better understand others. In your son's name we pray, amen. Good morning, welcome to Children's Circle. My name is Heather and I'm going to be sharing a story with you today. So the theme that Jill is going to be talking about in her sermon is the persecution of the early church. Now to persecute somebody means to be mean to them or hurt them or try to stop them because of something about them you don't like. It might be their beliefs that you don't like. So the early church was persecuted because its beliefs were seen as being threatening to the people who were in power. But you might also persecute somebody because you don't like the color of their skin or the country that they come from. So persecution happens for a lot of different reasons. And the story I'm going to share with you today is an excellent example of someone who stood up to persecution. So let me share my screen so you can see the story too. It is the story of Ruby Bridges, whom you may have heard about in school already, but I think she's important enough to talk about again. So let's keep talking about her. And an important thing for you to keep in mind about this story is, though the pictures are black and white and it looks like it happened a long time ago, the events of this story actually took place only eight years before I was born. And I might not look that young to you guys, but I'm not that old either. So something that happened that close to my life is not as far back in history as we might want to believe it is. So here's the story of Ruby Bridges. A long time ago, except not that long, some people thought that black people and white people should not be friends. 
in some places, black people were not allowed to live in the same neighborhoods as white people. And you see the boy holding the sign here saying he won't go to school with Negroes. In some places, black people were not allowed to eat in the same restaurants as white people. The small picture is a restaurant that says white only. Only white people were allowed to eat there. The larger picture is a restaurant that was what they called the time for colored people. And in some places, black children and white children could not go to the same schools. This is called segregation. Segregation is when you separate groups of people. The United States government said segregation is wrong. People should live where they want. People should eat where they want. Children should go to school where they want. My name is Ruby Bridges. In 1960, I went to kindergarten in a school for black children. I liked my school. I liked my teacher. I liked my friends. But there was a school for white children even closer to my house than the school for black children. It was the William France Elementary School. The government said Ruby Bridges should be allowed to go to the William France School. In 1961, I was in first grade. My mother took me to the France School. Marshals came with us to make sure that we were safe. Now, I'm sure all of you have had first day of school pictures taken by your parents many, many times every year when you start school. So imagine if you are in your first day of school clothes having taken your picture and you have to have federal marshals or federal policemen escort you into school. This is why. Some people did not want a black child to go to the white school. They stood near the school. They yelled at me to go away. So here are the people holding signs telling Ruby Bridges they don't want her there. And notice how much bigger and older they are than her. Parents, of their parents took their children out of the school. I was alone with my teacher, Mrs. Henry. So all of the children were taken out on the first day that she went to school. And gradually some of the white children came back, but none of them came back to her class. She was alone in her first grade class for the entire year. And Mrs. Henry taught to her as if she were teaching the entire class. I loved Mrs. Henry. And Mrs. Henry loved me. I was a very good student. I learned math. I learned how to read. But I wished the children would come back. Months and months passed. Then one day, children began to come back to the school. At last, I had friends to play with. I was very, very happy. Many people have read about me in newspapers and books. A famous writer, John Steinbeck, wrote about me. He wrote that I was very brave. A first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, wrote a letter to me. The letter told me that I was a good American. Norman Rockwell was an artist who painted a picture of me. The painting has become very famous. And this is a reproduction of the picture that she's talking about, painted by Norman Rockwell. You can see his signature at the bottom of the page, and you can see the graffiti that has been kind of washed off on the building behind her. The title of the picture is uh, The Sin We All Live With. No, the problem we all live with. And this picture was displayed at the White House when President Obama was in the White House and Ruby Bridges got to go to the White House and see the picture with Obama. And Obama told her that if it hadn't been for her, he didn't think he would have been in the White House. Now I am grown up. I am married. I have children. One day, Mrs. Henry and I were both asked to be on a TV show. That was the first time we had seen each other in many years. Now we talk to each other often. Now black children and white children can go to the same schools. I like to visit schools. I tell my story to children. I tell children that black people and white people can be friends 
So this is grown up Ruby Bridges signing books for children. And most important, I tell children to be kind to each other. So that is the story of Ruby Bridges, who I agree with John Steinbeck. I think she was an incredibly brave girl to face all of that hate. And I did some extra reading about her. And one of the things I learned was that every morning when she had to walk through that crowd of hate, she would stop and say a prayer for the people who were persecuting her. And she would pray for her persecutors to not be so filled with hate and she would forgive them for persecuting her, which seems to me a pretty monumental task to do. But inspired by Ruby, let's close with a prayer about how we might respond to persecution, whether we are being persecuted or whether we are trying to stand up for and with those who are being persecuted. Dear God, please strengthen our hearts and fill us with courage that we may face those who would persecute us and members of our community, that we may meet them courageously, and that we may have the grace of spirit to pray for their forgiveness and that as our hearts become strong, they never become hard. In this way, help us to make real our vision of your love on this earth. Amen. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Good morning. And welcome to Redlands United Church of Christ virtual worship service. I certainly want to thank Beth and Heather, Val and Loring, Sophia and Zoe for making today's worship service a meaningful one. I do want to remind you that following worship today, we will hold our fellowship hour at 1.30, the Next Steps Committee will meet. Tomorrow at 5, the Racial Justice Team will meet. We will hold Bible study at 7 tomorrow night. Tuesday at 7, we will hold our board meeting. Wednesday at noon, the Pastor is in gathering will take place. At 3.15 on Wednesday, the youth group will meet. And at 7.30 on Thursday evening, Prayer Polygon will meet. All of these meetings will take place through Zoom. So there is no doubt there are many ways to get involved in the life of this congregation. This church is alive and healthy. And I certainly want to thank you for the ways that you support the vital ministries of Redlands United Church of Christ. Thank you for the ways that you give through time, talent, and treasure. And now, as we move to our prayer concerns, in particular, I would like to lift up Dick Alt. Dick was in the ICU he has been moved to an acute care facility, and so we pray for comfort and healing for Dick as he faces some health challenges. And I want to lift up this deep and growing movement that addresses systemic racism and structural injustice in our country. And my prayer is that you too will be a part of this movement. If you have any prayer concerns, I invite you to share those prayer concerns silently or aloud, or write those prayer concerns in the comment section below. Let us be a congregation at prayer, first entering into a time of silence.
O God of the Exodus, of liberation and new life, you are the God of Moses, and you are the God of Harriet, Frederick, Sojourner, Martin, and you are our God, too. You call generations past and present to transform our hurting and broken world into a just society. We confess, however, that too often we look at the pain and injustice that surrounds us and we cry out, Where are you, O God? Meanwhile, you ask us, Where are you? You challenge us to hear the question, Where are you? And we thank you for those who have answered, here I am. We thank you for Harriet, Sojourner, Frederick, Ida, Du Bois, Garvey, Mays, Martin, Malcolm, Thurman, Ella, and all who have answered, here I am. May we, too, add our voice to theirs, recognizing that we have the power to build a movement from these moments. May we declare today, here I am. Send me, O God. In the name of Jesus the Christ, the radical revolutionary from Galilee, we pray, praying, Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the sound of one voice. One Spirit, one voice The sound of one who makes a choice This is the sound of one voice This is the sound of one voice This is the sound of voices too The sound of me singing with you Helping each other to make it through This is the sound of voices too This is the sound of voices too This is the sound of voices three Singing together in harmony Surrendering to the mystery This is the sound of voices three This is the sound of voices three This is the sound of all of us Singing with love and the will to trust Leave the rest behind, it'll turn to dust This is the sound of all of us 
This is the sound of all of us. This is the sound of one voice, one people, one voice, a song for every one of us. This is the sound of one voice, this is the sound of one Today's scripture reading is from Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. Thank you, Loreen, and thank you, Beth. Many of us are familiar with that song of resistance, We Shall Overcome. The words go like this. We shall overcome someday. We'll walk hand in hand someday. The truth will set us free someday. But my question this morning is, when is someday? The death of Maud Arbery was heartbreaking. The death of Breonna Taylor was soul-wrenching. Witnessing the death of George Floyd literally took the breath right out of us. And what I want to know is, when is some day? How many more bodies must be broken? How many more lives must be lost? How many more mothers wailing in anguish before we come to some day? Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome some day, but when is some day? Is some day a distant dream dangling in the future? When is some day? When will we no longer live under the viral agent of racism? When is some day? Tracy Blackman, who is an African-American pastor and the executive minister for witness and justice in the United Church of Christ, says this, We are done. We are done with the needless killings of our children. We are done bearing the burden of greed. We are done with the marginalization of being in a country that we helped to build. We are done. We are done with modulating our voices and tempering our expressions, compromising both our humanity and our divinity. We are done. 
I wonder if the woman in today's scripture passage is done too. Severely bent over for 18 years, it has been a long time since she's been able to look up. Her gaze is confined to that which is beneath her. Luke does not tell us how old this woman is. Has she spent her entire life bent over or a significant portion of her life? We do not know. What we do know, though, is that she went to the temple. And I like to think that she went to the temple because she was done. Being bent over in, impacts all aspects of life. Being burdened, weighed down, would affect any person. And she goes to the temple. In spite of those who may judge her, she goes to the temple. In spite of those who may blame her condition on her, she still goes to the temple. In spite of those who have no empathy for her, she still goes to the temple. She goes to the temple not to be healed because she is not sick. She is burdened. She is weighed down. She suffers through no fault of her own. The scripture says that a spirit is wearing her down. And many in our country know about a spirit of oppression, a spirit of injustice that wears one down, that weighs a person down. No wonder Tracy Blackman says, we are done. The infected and the affected both bear a burden. Both are limited in their ability to be fully free, whether a person is held down or whether a person is propped up. And the woman in today's scripture passage is a metaphor for the weight of oppression. And Jesus has a remedy. Jesus sees her. He sees her. And when he sees her, he stops teaching. He stops doing what he is doing in order to attend to her needs. What would it be like if we stopped business as usual to see the needs of one another? I wonder, how far did Jesus need to bend down in order to make eye contact with her? In what ways did Jesus need to contort himself? In what ways did he need to risk his own comfort in order to see her? Seeing can be uncomfortable, but Jesus sees her and he treats her needs as holy. And as this woman moves from the marginalization to the center, we see that she is set free. Jesus centers her. Jesus reclaims her. And though Luke gives no name to this woman, Jesus calls her daughter of Abraham. In other words, Jesus is saying, you are family. You belong and you are set free. And when those who are on the margins are brought to the center, everyone is set free. We are at a very critical time in our country right now. For the past 400 years, this country has been weighed down by a spirit of oppression, by a spirit of injustice. And for the past 75 years, 
we have been singing, we shall overcome someday. And I am wondering, when is someday? Could we begin to see glimmers of someday today? Are we beginning to see one another? Are we beginning to see our own inherent prejudice and bias? Are we beginning to see the systemic racism that dominates our country? At the beginning of this year, my prayer was that we would be granted 2020 vision in this year 2020. And I'm beginning to wonder whether that prayer is being answered through the many protests that we are seeing throughout the country. Never in my lifetime have I seen so many white people protest in our country, protest systemic racism, protest structural injustice. We are seeing protests across the country. Monuments celebrating Confederates are being taken down. We are seeing discussions taking place regarding Black Lives Matter, regarding police reform. And in fact, the street outside of the White House has been renamed Black Lives Matter. And even Lady Annabellum has changed her name to Lady A. Yes, we are seeing protests across the country, but we are seeing protests not only across the country, but we are seeing protests across the globe, across the world. In Amsterdam, nearly 10,000 people gathered together in Dam Square, holding signs that say Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace. In Athens, Greece, protesters collectively held up a sign that read, I can't breathe. And in Berlin, there was a mural that was spray painted on the wall, the wall that divided the city during the Cold War. It is a mural of George Floyd. In cities across the world, in cities in Europe, cities in Mexico, cities in Canada, in Brazil, in New Zealand, and Australia, people are protesting and demanding justice. And let us not forget that we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Imagine if we were not in the midst of a pandemic, how many people would be going into the streets to protest the injustice. Oh, we sing, we shall overcome someday. When is someday? My prayer is that we will join a movement, the revolution, the spiritual revival, the moral imagination, which builds someday, today. Let it be so. Amen.
us pray. Loving God, as we go forward into our week, help us to remember that someday should be today. That today is the day to help one another. Today is a day to reach out. Today is a day to start what we want for our future. In your son's name we pray. Amen. every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmonies of liberty thank you for lifting your voice and thank you for being a part of today's worship experience and gathered in worship this morning are four more pictures drawn by the mystery artist and here those pictures are now. Welcome, Mary and Dan. Julie, Ellen, and Janet. It is good to have you in worship this morning. And a huge thank you to our mystery artist who continues to dazzle us. This morning we sang, Lift Every Voice and Sing. 
Indeed, may we speak up, stand up, and show up for justice. May we create a movement from these moments, and may we begin building someday today. Let it be so. Amen? Amen. Thank you.